Ohm. All right, so where I left off with the Dakshinayana, the Uttarayana, and the Dakshinayana, it's the northern or southern course of the sun, and it's basically splits up the year into a six-month portion. So this is like a really, really big deal. <laughs> this is a big thing, and it's kind of so big that it's hard for me to just kind of talk off the top of my head about it. So I've written some notes down about it here that I want to make sure I cover. <clears throat> but this movement up and down of the sun uh, along the ecliptic moving north making the days get longer until the peak in the summer solstice when cancer begins and then moving south. We have to understand that that is uh, that is actually like the basis for our seasons and our environments. And this is a very ancient thing. Like a lot of the ancient yogic texts, a lot of just the ancient in Indian texts overall talk about this Atarayana and the Dakshinian. Um, so the Atarayana is the northern movement of the sun, the six months moving north. And that's when the gods are said to wake up. And that's said to be the dwelling place of the gods is in the north. Like Shiva, like Shiva is always being described like on a Himalayas, like in the on the icy mountaintops up in the north, you know? And uh, the yogis are said to dwell on Mount Meru, I believe, which is like, uh, some people think it's like a metaphor for the North Pole or something, but it's like a northern mountain. I don't know, there's kind of differing opinions about that. And, um, and we know that yogis go to the North Himalayas and things like that to retreat from the world. And because the vibrations are a lot more uh, pure up there. And so then again the sun will go south again and then that's when uh, that's sort of like the realm of the Asuras or the titans of Greek mythology or the worldly forces of the senses and materialization and things. So um, as the sun's moving south in a general sense we put our energy is like going south, south inwardly through the chakras and that's the thing is the planets all exist uh, in our chakras and they rule chakras and you can watch my video about that, the zodiac and the chakras if you need to know more about that if you aren't aware because I've talked about it too much sometimes. So when the sun is moving up, we're moving up in consciousness because the sun is the Sarvatman or the soul of the universe. So the collective consciousness, if you want to say, or the universe, is, universal consciousness tends to move up and ascend during that six month period of the Tariana, the sun moving north, the days are getting longer. There's more light coming into the world. The, the plants and the trees start growing and bursting out once the vernal equinox comes and Aries begins tropical areas. Um, and then the six months that the sun is moving south, the energy is going down and we're, we, we don't always, we can, we can drop in our consciousness. We can actually tend to drop in our consciousness. And if we're not spiritually motivated or, you know, uh, just inspired people, then it can be very tough during that time as the energy is moving down. It can feel so hard. Even if we are really inspired doing all these other things, spiritual whatever, yada, yada, yada stuff, even if we are doing that stuff, it can still be very hard. So it's interesting that yogis and that Hindu culture has always known about this effect on our consciousness because yogis have said for a long time that if we leave our body when the sun is going south, especially below after the autumnal equinox, after Libra starts, like October, November, December, from the time when the sun is moving below the heart chakra down to the lower chakras, or all our heavier, deeper issues are at, the one is more likely to need to be reborn, and one is more likely going to be caught up in rebirths and is, it's less likely that their soul is moving to a higher place, is what the general teaching is. And likewise, if one leaves their body, when the sun is moving north, it was said that liberation or moksha was more likely to happen or take place, or at least the soul was more likely to be moving forward, moving upward in consciousness.
at that time. Like you would go to a higher realm or you might not necessarily have to be reborn in a body. So that, that was seen as a very good thing. And actually, when it comes to the sun moving down, like where we're at right now, this time of year, the time of this video, the time of me making this video, it's December 16th, 2017, at about almost 3 o'clock p.m. And we're, we're right in it. We're right in this very yin, very low tide, sort of low energy where the gods are sleeping. You know, this, this sort of, we're in the underworld right now. And you can really feel this more so from the time of Scorpio and Sagittarius beginning. And anyway, so what I was going to say is that people born in autumn are actually less likely to be depressed. People who are born during this time of year, it's almost like they're born with this. And so every other time of the year, the sun and things are doing better stuff. You know, there's more of a movement that's positive going on. But yeah, for some reason, scientific studies have proven that people born in autumn are less likely to be depressed across the board. I wrote an article about that on my website if you want to read more. It's called A New Study Complements Ancient Astrology. If you search for that. Um, the other thing, though, is that more people commit suicide in November and December. So we can see a strong case, like we can see how that connects to what uh, the Vedic culture has said about this time because more people in modern society are said to kill themselves or commit suicide and things like that around November and December than other months. And that's just sort of like a, a fact that you can read about. We know why, because the sun's just so low. But maybe if if they went to get help, they went to an astrologer, we could at least tell them, just hang in there for another couple of months and it might start to feel better. Just, you know, just don't die. Don't check out until, until after Christmas when the solstice has begun. That leads me to the next cool thing about this Atarayana and Dakshinayana. Um, I know I might not be saying that right. I can't even remember if there's a long A in there or not really. Um, so forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that right to my Indian audience. Um, so why do we give gifts on Christmas? Um, it's really funny, but my teacher first pointed that out when he was talking about this. It's really funny how we wait till Christmas to give gifts to everyone, and that Christmas just happens to be the first day in six months, if we're using the solar calendar, the first day in six months since June 22nd or whatever, that it's truly an auspicious day. So from a Mahertha standpoint, December 25th, or like December 24th, it kind of depends on, because again, our Gregorian calendar is not exactly right, and so it can depend on the year, but around December 24th or 25th or 23rd is going to be the, uh, like the sun has reached its deepest point and actually said to stay there and not really move forward or backwards hardly at all for three days. And then it starts to visibly, noticeably move north. It's not that noticeable for those three days, they say. And that's also allegorically connected to Jesus Christ and dying for three days and then the Christ is born on Christmas and all that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence that Christians, that Jesus may not have even been born at this time, but they, they connected this in with more ancient solar pagan traditions. So whether that's the case or not, I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, and I'm not a historical expert. Uh, but it is really funny that from Vedic astrology standpoint, the first auspicious day to give gifts uh, for six months is Christmas. And so that's also neat because, uh, and also that is a tropical calculation. So a lot of, so in mainstream India, people will wait till January 13th or 14th to celebrate Makara Sankranti, which is the same thing as saying Atarayana or the northern course of the sun, because Makara means Capricorn, like I've said before, the gator, the sea monster, um, and Capricorn is... Yeah, so the Capricorn ingress is the exact same thing as saying the beginning of Atarayana. <clears throat> and likewise, saying Cancer ingress is the same as 
this uh, Dakshiniana movement. And remember, Cancer is the most yin sign, the most withdrawing, moving back, yielding sign. And that's, that's why, because at the moment Cancer begins, the sun begins to yield and begins to withdraw and go back. So, so yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is one reason why I use the Tropical Zodiac as well. Um, because it, nature is bound to the seasons, um, more so than to very, very, very far away stars that have their own planets and their own seasons that they're creating very, very far away. And that light might even be gone um, by now. Like, you know, we see the light of stars, but we're actually seeing the light of those stars from millions of years ago sometimes even, light years ago. Um, so the sun, the sun and moon... An Earth, sorry, the Sun and Earth relationship has not changed as long as time, as long as we've known it, and so uh, that's this this cycle that we're talking about is the Atarian and the Dakshinian, and it is a very big part of ancient Hindu culture. Let me sh give you some more explanations, or uh, let me flesh that case out a little bit. So Krishna even says, "Of seasons, I am the spring." Um, so. You know, in Vedic culture, they have six seasons of two months each. So I think he might have been talking about a little bit different of a spring month than we you might be thinking of. But it's like Vasant season, I believe. I think that's what he was talking about. I'm not. I can't remember off the top of my head. But Krishna says, "I am spring of all the seasons." And in springtime, I always feel so inspired and so creative, and even more like musical, more emotional. I'll be driving and. Uh, these just emotions will come up that just make me want to like weep at the beauty of life and the sun and the lake and the marsh and just to exist in this creation where everything is just coming up reaching towards the light and just be enamored in it all and that that's not to say that there's not good time for contemplation and good feelings that I can experience at this time of the year too like we were saying in the last video but there's this upward movement um, especially when we get to like Aries and Taurus in April and May and the Sun is moving into the heart chakra and also cultures always celebrate fertility festivals around that time of the year like since the beginning of time we have May Day we have Beltane um, all these sorts of pagan festivals in Western culture will happen around that time. All sorts of fertility rites, the flowers, just the smell of flowers and pollen is just like filling the air. That's just synonymous with energy moving upwards, if you ask me. Um, energy moving downwards at the opposite time of the year. Like I said about fall in the last video, everything's turning within. It's this opposite type of energy. Um, then there's also that interesting phenomenon of how more saints are said to leave their body during the Atariana. So this is like something that I've noticed so much ever since I've been, you know, reading about gurus, which has been over a decade of my life now, and they almost always check out and leave their body when the sun is moving north. Um, and especially like they might still check out during the summertime but they don't leave their body until they tend to not leave their body after like into october like there's like if you go on wikipedia and read the lists of hindu gurus and saints there's very very few that leave their body in october november or uh, december and most of them leave their body at the other three-fourths of the year i wrote a few examples of this down um Sri Yukteswar, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Yogananda, uh, Upasni Maharaj, Ramana Maharshi, Mayor Baba, even that guy Srinivasa Ramanujan, that mathematician guy, who's like a brilliant mathematician, him too, um, you know, even Muhammad, uh, the most recent, well, you know, um, supposedly we have documentations of his birth and death. Um, and yeah, so just tons, tons of people, but those are just some ones that I thought of off the top of my head, but it's, it's, it definitely is the case most of the time, but I'm not saying that if a saint died during those, during November that he's not a good saint or anything, but it's just generally, you know, because there's always exceptions in nature and um, we don't really know what a higher conscious being is wanting to do or needing to do. He might, who knows, but that's a general thing that you'll notice to be very true. Um... <clears throat> 
that's kind of the opposite of the committing suicide. You know what I mean? Of people oh, like facing all their heaviest issues in November and December, just can't seem to run from it. And then, you know, they give up and, and, and kill themselves. And so, um, the opposite is like a saint who's mastered everything. It's like he's finished his homework in school and he's finished all his objectives and he gets to go home early or something and goes home while there's still daylight, you know, and, uh, enjoys the rest of the day off. Then there's also uh, the story of Bhishma in the Mahabharata. And in the Mahabharata, there are different characters that represent different uh, parts of the self. And Bhishma said, I believe he represents the ego mind. And the ego mind is so tough to die. And somehow this guy was granted a boon that he could choose when he dies, I believe. And he, there's this insane battle, you know, because like basically all these kind of all these Kshatriyas are dying and you know he's at the end of this battle and like everyone's dead but he waits he knows that the Atarayan is coming in like 10 days and so he waits 10 days to die he just lays there on the battlefield for 10 days and then he waits and then he dies because he knows that he has a greater chance of moving upward and ascending or of achieving moksha um, if he dies in when the Atarayan is coming. So that's why that's an, also part of why he waited. Um, and that also, I never thought about this too, but someone recently pointed out on the, this, uh, on the studying call forum on the internet that Bhishma is a single sim, symbol of the ego mind. It's also really cool how it takes like 10 days to die like after the battle because yogis and saints oftentimes after they've like done so much, they kind of have to just like wait and wait out like the last bits of the ego just sort of uh just sort of like running itself off um and it takes a long you know it just there sort of is this like this element of that waiting 10 days even after the battle and the war is really won and there's still just these residual effects of the ego and you have to st stay stay with it even past that okay so so now you've seen that there is like there's even some scientific evidence um, with modern life and the depression, the suicide, and things like that. And then with saints dying, you can't you know you can't you can't avoid that. That's pretty objective evidence. And so you can see it. There's even some objective scientific evidence to validate what these Hindus have always been talking about. And it's just really powerful knowledge, in my opinion. And one more thing is that when you do yoga practices like uh, Kriya Pranayama or these different exercises or even Hatha Yoga, all the stretches and asanas that people are doing, it's to create heat and bring the energy and bring more prana and energy into the spine and then you sit and meditate and you bring the energy up into the higher brain centers and do, bringing that energy up and down is basically what liberates us faster and even one like uh, Pranayama cycle like in the tradition that I was taught that that actually is like intentionally speeding up your own evolution because they say that one million years of one million years of healthy human living is required to get liberated and then we just wake up on our own like a million of these revolutions of the Atarayana and the Dakshinyana happening in a healthy awake disease free body one actually just wakes up on their own and so yogis or like especially like sadhus and uh, intense like Shiva uh, yoga paths are essentially just trying to speed this process up and so they're doing lots of uh, rigid uh, sorry rigorous yogic procedures to bring more Agni more solar energy into the spine with like because normally it's going out into the senses and then turning it back within into the spine and bringing it up into the higher brain and that's just doing that enough and a matter of time of staying there and one is especially is essentially like speeding up that million years so you can read more about that in autobiography of a yogi if you want um, in the chapter called the science of kriya yoga um, yeah i think that's about it so i hope you guys uh, appreciate this video